good evening uh, everybody uh, to all the participants and uh, our speaker my colleagues in archaeological sciences center at uh, iit gandhinagar uh, we are happy to uh, meet you all of you again uh, for our eighth lecture in the monthly lecture series of uh, uh, archaeological sciences center uh, we have been uh, looking into various uh, aspects of archaeology Uh, from prehistory to protohistory and today we have a very interesting talk uh, we are happy to introduce you all to professor ajay pratap from banaras hindu university and he is a, he is a professor in the department of uh, history banaras hindu university and his uh, doctoral thesis uh, is from uh, cambridge university he has looked into the ethno archaeological aspect of the pahadia uh, tribes of jharkhand and the shifting ag agricultural practices under uh, professor alchin so uh, it's it's a wonderful opportunity for him uh, to have worked with uh, one of the uh, most important personalities personalities of south asian archaeology and in the recent past he has been working extensively on the uh, documentation and analysis of rock art particularly in the uh, mirzapur and sonbad regions of uh, uttar pradesh and uh, he has also published uh, uh, several articles and uh, sort of uh, various publications on the importance of uh, Uh, on the on the rock art. So, without uh, uh, much wastage of time, I would uh, uh, request uh, Professor Ajay Pratap to uh, deliver the lecture, and I will be sharing the uh, presentation on his uh, behalf. And uh, Professor Ajay Pratap. Uh, the... Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon. Good evening uh, to everybody. Uh, I would like to start with uh, thanking uh, the organizers, uh, Professor Michel Danino, uh, Professor uh, uh, Professor V N Prabhakar, and uh, Professor Sharda um, for inviting this contribution from uh, from myself. And uh, as I happen to be on a sabbatical year, sabbatical which started last July, uh, continuing. how to uh, the exploration into how to use rock art as uh, source material for ancient history uh, this uh, this opportunity to reflect over the material uh, particularly in the framework of how it could possibly have uh, in its symbolic evolution uh, led towards the development of language and script was an extremely sort of uh, challenging if daunting sort of uh, prospect uh, from the very beginning uh, but uh, i sort of got over my jitters as uh, we went in uh, into the problem because uh, in the vindhyan region particularly and that includes ancient magadh and uh, kasi and kosal and so on all the areas that uh, uh, the vindhyan resources sort of fueled in the ancient world the urbanization was fueled by uh, sort of uh, natural resources from the vindhyas much as nilgiri uh, uh, series of formations uh, natural formations fuel the rise of the state in southern india in much the same way uh, vindhyas has acted uh, for the uh, genetic plains so um, for today's uh, presentation uh, um, and uh, dr prohakar has uh, sort of uh, told me that uh, there is going to be uh, largely a public sort of audience and that means non specialist audience who would not have sort of immediate access to a lot of special terminology the terminologies that uh, historians and archaeologists both employ so i've tried to make the presentation very simple while uh, focusing on the key problem that has been given to me uh, uh, and over which i have read for a, a couple of months and so i've hit a couple of very interesting articles that uh, worth uh, sort of that are worth mentioning so basically the presentation uh, will first introduce the field area and uh, thereafter we'll go a bit into the landscapes that obtain here and the kind of lifestyles that have obtained here since prehistory and then uh, i would put forth a uh, a sort of um, a hypothesis about the existence of uh, a long term uh, visuality in terms of human expression and human sensibilities uh given this large large uh, sort of uh, hilly or mountainous zone that has been inhabited for a very very long time and then i'll let you know uh, tell you something about the early vindhyan populations there's been extensive research here for the last 50 years 
certainly after independence and much before that too in the uh, colonial period when first of antiquarian explorations uh, started in this area so uh, that gives us some idea about the early vindian populations but also uh, there has been a lot of ancient historical research by way of finding of inscriptions in this particular area now vindhya is very rich in sandstones which have been used for millennia in this country by uh, various uh, rulers starting with ashoka and uh, for his mauryan pillars uh, for his uh, uh, pillar inscriptions for his rock in some of his rock inscriptions then in 1545 we have uh, sher shah building his entire sort of mausoleum in sasaram and in 1617 we have jahangir building his uh, sufi mosque at uh, maner so vindhyan sandstone has traveled a long distance and in all sorts of ways uh, as something of very high value so relationship between rock art and scripts uh, is a absolutely legitimate sort of uh, exercise as i found so thereafter i'll give you a bit of uh, overview of the paintings that my students and i uh, over field work in the last 10 years have been fortunate to document and to encounter in person and we keep going back again and again and again how rich our sort of uh, country is and how rich this particular region is and how sustaining the idea that visual expression has a extremely long history uh, in this uh, country so then broad overview of paintings and uh, uh, then we will look at some of the narrative themes which struck struck us as uh, the most dynamic aspect of rock painting over here is the capture of movement a lot of movement has been recorded uh, in one of the uh, panels that you'll see there even flying arrows and the arrows have been sketched in various stages of flight and so on there are numerous others with uh, you know animals being speared and people running and so on which we thought was absolutely outstanding and then i would come to the idea that this entire area now uh, the entire vindhyan range which is rather well populated from uh, early on and on the periphery of the vindhyan region you get small state formations uh, right through history particularly 6th century bc onwards but the the main run of the population in the vindhyas is what would broadly be called a farming community or uh, a subaltern community broadly speaking there are medieval and pre medieval fortifications that come up over there and they act more or less in a manorial sort of way and uh, the peasantry in this area which is constituted by the myriad uh, tribes and castes over here are absolutely absolutely the sort of uh, the, the, the feudal sort of uh, peasantry that uh, works for various uh, forts in the area and producing so it is very important to actually see Uh, even artistic production in this particular area particularly the later artistic production as born uh, through the interrelationship with the outside community so i don't think uh, if we couldn't argue for this say in rajmahal hills where i have worked most of my uh, sort of uh, professional time or research time then this can't be argued here either and these areas are, are best labeled as ethnic domains where you have a multiplicity Uh, of tribes and castes and their own articulations in which state has no great role to play from the big, big, very beginning perhaps even to this day so these are very exceptional areas and uh, uh, all artistic production in a sense answers to an internal or indigenous dynamic which to borrow uh, gopal guru professor gopal guru and uh, sundar sarukai's very newly coined term uh, i believe last year which is everyday social how is the normal sort of circumstance represented symbolically then we will come to uh, directionality in paintings and so on and how uh, that reflects uh, life in ancient times then we'll go to some inscriptions that we have ourselves just by chance found in the course of our own research over rock art and that seem to be a suitable sort of database with which to sort of uh, test of this proposition of the interconnection between uh, rock paintings and uh, and uh, uh, inscriptions uh, whether there is any evolutionary link between the two then i shall summarize and conclude this talk thank you may we have the next slide please right 
So to explain the field area to you, this is the state of Uttar Pradesh, and the uh, the two districts that we are looking at is uh, sir, is my cursor visible to you, Dr. Prabhakar? Is my cursor visible to you in the presentation? No, I don't think so. No. Acha, okay. So the the bottom two districts on the right hand side of the map of Uttar Pradesh are Mirzapur. and the bottom most is sonbhadra it is dissected in the middle by the river son and son is a tributary of the river ganges and a number of vindhyan rivers like grihan from the south and karamnasha from the north they are tributaries of the son system now on either side of the son river going from west to east or rather east to west uh, this this is the sort of axis in which the vindhyan highlands are arranged uh, on both sides of of the river north and south and almost the entire range the southern side after the uh, sort of sonbhadra district falls in chatisgarh uh, both sides are absolutely covered in shelters which have rock art um, maybe go to the next slide please right so uh, the rock shelters uh, that we have looked at uh, a uh, border on uh, a part of the vindhyas that uh, abuts into uh, nearly four states that is bihar and jharkhand and chatisgarh and madhya pradesh and so on to the idea which has uh, in fact uh, been uh, postulated by uh, a curator of patna museum by the name of uh, manoranjan ghosh who actually surveyed the, the rock art in this area and other antiquities as early as 1932 but more importantly at that time he also took some pic pictures and he had a draftsman with him who drafted uh, and drew images and painted images of early inscriptions which were found on various fortifications like vijayagarh and so on and he went through uh, chatisgarh and uh, located a number of painted rock shelters over there and then crossed over the son uh, system and came into the highland vindhyas and went to places like likhania dari and chuna dari which we shall discuss uh, shortly and he recorded the rock paintings rock paintings over there so let us uh, introduce ourselves uh, together with the field area into to the idea that uh, actually these four states have a confluence over here culturally and that early populations that may have come into the son valley uh, uh, and it is appropriate to mention the work say of uh, chris clarkson over here uh, who has followed upon uh, the hypotheses laid earlier by say jr sharma and his team and uh, perhaps even before that by gudrun corvinus who found stone age sites across the gangetic plains in the nepalese kerai that uh, human habitation in the son valley should could be as many as 140000 years old and started with the homo erectus and leading up to mo modern man's uh, coming into this area around 50000 uh, uh, bp so uh, the uh, the area uh, the son valley particularly uh, has a number of absolutely lower uh, paleolithic sites although they are later shulian slightly younger than those in the narmada valley and there are, there is a sub subsequent development to middle paleolithic and the coming of modern man and upper paleolithic all these are in the valley areas the mesolithic settlements over here cluster upon the vindhyan escarpment and the shelters where they are usually found are all absolutely chock full of uh, paintings so that has been the focus of our own work uh, i might add also that we have actually concentrated on thanks on documenting the rock paintings as we found that most of the projects working in the area had covered everything and contributed enormously to our knowledge but left the rock art well alone so it is that nearly 250 painted rock shelters over here with enormous catchment areas were neither documented nor unfortunately are they to this day protected by the government of india so uh, there was a great need to actually for a university based research project to actually document it and when we went about it and reading the research literature both uh, both on the vindhyas and uh, here the contributions of allahabad university is most outstanding followed say 
by our own university in the plains and uh, a group of uh, very dedicated research workers like Chris Clarkson uh, as well as Michael Petraglia and Michael Hasdam and so on who have also been excavating in the Son Valley and giving us very very uh, sort of a clear picture about what was happening here since about 100000 years ago also they have contributed very clear timelines using irsl dates and so on that that improve upon those uh, existing before this but what they have not covered again over here is that because it is uh, you know uh, because of its location the vindian area is absolutely network to the rest of the country in every direction so so i have uh, put the superscript of this particular map as it's an early exchange area for plant and animal domesticates ground and polished stone tools rock art and calligraphic motifs metallurgical know how a number of teams over here including dr akesh tiwari uh, have excavated and found the earliest evidence for iron working and that is not a surprise because the uh, top uh, portion of the escarpment of this range has weathered and uh, yielded laterites although they are less uh, sort of uh, as reserves of iron they are less than what obtains in bengal or further south in india say in, in kerala where you get about 100 feet thick sections of laterites it's not that tropical out here but it is significant for a number of industries to be based in sonbhadra and so on but from around 1800 bc you do get uh two years and uh, things like that where iron has been uh, manufactured and the same pattern continues from the sonbhadra district into southern bihar and it uh, you know it, it sort of goes into orissa and bengal and early iron sites occur all along preceded of course by neolithic and mesolithic cultures uh, occasionally upper paleolithic and earlier ones as well and rock paintings are ubiquitous over uh, this region uh, going uh, sort of east southeast as well as towards the west into madhya pradesh and into narmada valley so it does appeal to a historian that this entire region the vindhyan region in central india has a very special role in acting as a center for exchange of knowledge and ideas and raw material and has uh, uh, has sustained itself in that manner next please now this here is uh, uh, google earth images of our own sites to explain their location so we'll start with the uh, one on the top right hand corner uh, uh, in the left hand corner which was our very first site uh, this is called the windham falls now this is uh, located in a place called barkacha which is about 75 kilometers drive from uh, from varanasi and th this has a uh, uh, many areas that has uh, on which calcitic flows have taken place so with the help of uh, dr roman banerji uh, who is of the archaeological sciences center uh, we had uh, run some uth samples uh, of the of the calcites or rather he had run it for his phd project and the dates that obtain are clearly terminal pleistocene so they are older than 10000 bc each of the four dates so that gave us a lot of uh, sort of hope that uh, if we continue our work uh, looking for sites in the region maybe we will find what acl carlyle uh, way back in mid 19th century calls cup marks uh, along with other types of rock art if you are documenting then uh, you know the matter of choice does not arise very much but yes since we are a university we tend to exercise our choices a bit more than others so but the cup marks have eluded us uh, not the rock paintings though there have been thousands and thousands of uh, things that we have documented uh, so much so that we have about 3000 digital images of the paintings here so um, uh, the next site that we covered after windham is a very popular tourist spot of uh, varanasi region Uh, it is called likhania dari and chuna dari both are uh, sh shelters or caves with rock paintings in them and they are in a valley sort of thing which is at the top of the escarpment and a hill stream over there uh, river garai obtains and on a, a holiday if you go visiting there there will be thousands of people literally 
everybody loves nature here and never mind that the british have left us for the institution of uh, the picnic has survived in its i think original form in eastern india and uh, to our woe though a number of uh, tourists would uh, throw water on various paintings and they have faded away there's a bit of graffiti there too so the need to protect these sites through government legislation is very very important but lekhania valley uh, it tells us the settlement pattern in the area rather more clearly than does windham falls which is also a smaller area now the flatland on top i think is the most stable part of the landscape where most of the uh, uh, sort of population would have found it easy to subsist as well as reside although the earliest of population say upper paleolithic on account of being very small could have camped in this area and therefore a number of tool clusters were found say by manranjan ghosh uh, they are very scarce now uh, at likhania dari which is at this end and chuna dari over here so some very dynamic art which we shall have look at the next site that we covered is over here which is the morana pahar which has been known for an extremely extremely long time as a very ethnographically sort of uh, uh, rich area on account of settlements of uh, true agro pastoralists uh, and uh, no less than my own supervisor dr fr alchin uh, had a chance to study them and we have got a small video of a traditional uh, agro pastoral cattle station within cattle station which the likes of which professor alchin would have looked at to understand how uh, cow dung mounds build up at uh, neolithic sites he was excavating utnur and piklihal and places like that in southern india so he traveled over here to find an ethnographic parallel and he found it uh, very close to morana pahar and there's a number of uh, squares and uh, sort of rectangles we have placed over here each of them is a, a cluster of rock art sites not individual rock art sites so the morana escarpment alone would have over more than 50 individual clusters the very famous ones excavated by uh, say alabad university that is lekhaiya pahar is over here bhaisor uh, that legion over there bhaisor balai pahar and then uh, bagahi khor is over here uh, excavated by uh, professor r k verma and then professor vidula jaiswal excavated lahariya d shelter which he has rightly claimed to be upper paleolithic and uh, on account of non geometric microliths and uh, the absence of pottery and uh, the paintings that she has found in the shelter although a bit insecurely she says that it is upper paleolithic but in all likelihood it is correct but until it is verified by uh, whichever dating method there is no certainty in that claim but aprarai the idea that upper paleolithic populations would have inhabited is affirmed by the uh, the find of um, non geometric microliths like lun uh, lunates and crescents and so on which are still found uh, to this date and even in these areas the next uh, uh, google earth image is of one of the most gorgeously and uh, most uh, energetically painted it's also incidentally the site where the highest paintings uh, so, uh, highest elevation paintings or elevated paintings obtain and this is the uh, rocky part of the old belan uh, course or the course of old belan so it has abandoned its own, own channel and now flows up upstream and this area has got uh, become dry and uh, easily accessible it's easy for people to cross uh, the dry river bend uh, and actually see paintings which are located in this area and finally uh, closer to the zone now uh, of, of all these slides uh, mukhadari uh, is clo closer to closest to the zone but even closer is uh, this panchmukhi hill site uh, in chur uh, sort of tehsil of uh, sonbhadra so this is a hill uh, it's a tor sort of formation and it there used to be a 10th 11th century temple over here with beautifully carved pillars and so on it was already decrepit when we started our field work in 2009 and now there is very little evidence of that which is unfortunate but it yielded a number of very important sculptures and the panchmukhi name derives from uh, panchmukhi shiva image which is now installed in a new temple over there so th these are the three landscape components uh, which are relevant for us the, uh, this the top two are 
images of the Son River and the plain. And uh, the hill over here that you see is the Kaimur Plateau and the uh, Kaimur district starts on the other side. And uh, as the river exits the frame on the left-hand side towards these hills, it actually enters Bihar. Now, these are the river terraces which have been excavated uh, to great effect uh, by the uh, Professor G.R. Sharma's project, followed up by uh, Chris uh, Clarkson, Michael Petaglia, and Michael Hasdam, and so on. Uh, and uh, the highlands uh, are, are sites, as I was explaining with the help of Google Earth images before this, are divided into escarpment sites, which are on the flatland, which is where the greatest population is, and the valleys, the river valleys, where painted shelters also occur. Now, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? As I've actually covered uh, the business of lifestyles obtaining in this area. Now, uh, relevant to this particular lecture, given against the background, um, I would uh, propose that we see uh, rock art and inscriptions as part of an enormous uh, continuum obtained mainly by the continuing residence of people in that particular area. Now, prehistoric uh, landscapes are relatively uh, unchanged and settlements and temporary camps associated with a mobile population, late Paleolithic to Iron Age habitations, cupel marks, paintings in red, purple, light red, orange. There are about five types of ochres obtaining here in the form of mudstones, uh, given the geomorphological processes obtaining over here. So the first layer of visuality, which is, of course, over an extremely long uh, time period, I mean, if uh, Vimbetka cupules go back to 500,000 years ago, then you can imagine the length of time that we are talking about, uh, leading up to paintings themselves. And the painting tradition, uh, as, as some of the images will no doubt uh, reveal, but it is worth reiterating, continue right up to the colonial period. Yes. The people who were living in the caves continued to paint uh, contemporary themes. There are even medieval themes over there. So the painting tradition did not end until very recently. The next is, of course, the Iron Age, in which villages and rural urban settlements and farming and exchange of plant and animal domesticates and goods like forest products, locally smelted metallic copper and iron objects, ingots, Raja Nalka Tila excavations and Raipura are both uh, in the Vindhyan uplands, and uh, I think they are painted rock art sites contiguous to both. Then the next layer of visuality uh, is early and late historical. At this point of time, such as we will see in some of the paintings at Likhania Dari, the rock art has actually got stupa images painted. Now, that is not so surprising uh, because this area is really part of the ancient Buddhist geographies. And in many places near Banda, for instance, uh, you get uh, even relief images of, of the Buddhist kind carved into sheer rock. And uh, again, it is mentioned in uh, Bana's Harsha Charit as something, uh, a very important landscape. So uh, a number of rock paintings uh, have marching soldiers, elephant capture expeditions, and hunting parties, and so on and so forth. The Chunar has got... Um, uh, sort of uh, Ashokan quarries for making pillars, as uh, has been uh, discussed by Professor Vidula Jaiswal and Paul Craddock of British Museum. I heard his presentation on Mauryan iron mines at Riva, and that is extremely important that long distance sort of iron uh, ores uh, were being exploited. And so, to explain the presence of Ashokan inscriptions in this particular area, which we shall take up. And then the coming of the early, uh, late historic uh, scripts like Brahmi and uh, uh, the variants like Siddha Matrika and, uh, and uh, what's it called? Uh, Siddha Matrika and uh, Sankha, uh, in which inscriptions can be found often in rock shelters. So that again is an important uh, step in the visuality uh, or evolution of visuality in this particular area. Then the medieval sort of contributions are uh, transformations of landscape, revenue settlements, upland and lowland trade leading to control. And uh, there are spots uh, in the Vindhyas where much like Rajmahal, where chowkis, uh, medieval chowkis, uh, probably Mughal chowkis, uh, uh, were constructed by 
uh, on the main artery roads and uh, that is to uh, sort of secure the area for mail runners and for tradesmen and so on so at least one of our rock art sites likhania dari has got a medieval chowki and a go down sort of thing on the other hand side and uh, there are some river outs of tening which were probably used for taking away forest products from this area so medieval presence is very notable of course this is also the time uh, although uh, fe fe feudal sort of formations precede in this area if we go by uh, the famous uh, arya sharma sort of uh, take on this issue or his uh, uh, sort of suggestion that it is in the gupta period that uh, feudalism first takes root although there is a very interesting debate with professor arvans mukhya on that nevertheless the presence of state society is more, very emphatic from the early historical period and into the late historical period and medieval and representations of that in rock art are very very interesting and where soldiers are shown uh, sort of capturing elephants and hunting and so on so what exactly might have been happening between indigenous society and uh, medieval society uh, is depicted partly in rock art so uh, may, may we go to the next slide please since we have gone through this bit dr prabhu yeah so uh, in this uh, article uh, by g d g sivking published in 1961 we find mention of the archaeological uh, sort of artifacts found by uh, acl carlyle and uh, which were sent by him uh, to england and by some means they reach british museum and these include everything from paleolithic uh, chopper chopping tools to hand axes as well as upper paleolithic uh, uh, non geometric to mesolithic geometric and ground and polished stone tools burials with pottery even glazed pottery is mentioned uh, in cockburn's note which we shall go to next and he also mentions a few impressions no no just a moment dr prabhu maybe go back to the previous one i'm sorry uh, he mentions uh, sir king mentions that in uh, in carlyle's bequest or his collection at british museum a few impressions of cup marks on rocks so this is the uh, only reference we have to cupules of some kind of a marks occurring in this particular area but the continuity of the archaeological profile goes all the way to um, uh, the mention of iron ore fabricator from barkacha which we were discussing beforehand so may we go to the next slide please and this is a note uh, from my own book uh, about uh, cockburn also noticing much the same things where in uh, south mirzapur which is in uh, sonbhadra across the son river or south of the son river in the village near kon river he uh, finds neolithic burials and implement manufactories and they yield much the same things uh, that are found from the koldiva but they are uh, sort of uh, uh, i mean they are very very noticeable as existing uh, on the southern side of of the river son on the uh, side bordering jharkhand so may we go to the next one please and these are the unfortunately i couldn't get hold of any images of uh, rounded butt axes and ground tools from uh, uttar pradesh particularly uh, chalpur uh, sorry uh, koldihwa and mahagara and you know uh, those areas but uh, uh, these are actually the reverend po boarding collection from santhal parganas and uh, the the images that i have managed to see but not copy and reproduce for you over here uh, there is a resemblance between the polished tools from uh, the the vindhan area and uh, they are on much the same material i will add to that the comment made by uh, professor j n pal in his note on early farming cultures of vindhyas that uh, there are there is the presence there is no presence of waste flakes of ground tools on the right in the vindhyan region and so to the uh, sort of suggestion that these might have been exported uh, or imported rather from uh, a place rich in basalts which could be central india which could be vindhyas itself they do have some uh, dolerite uh, sort of uh, presence 
but most outstanding basaltic zone in this area are the rajmahal hills themselves and all the ground and polished sort of tools at chinand for instance which is a bihar uh, ganga plain not not bihar ganga plain site they are all derived from this direction and uh, in terms of the google earth image i showed you earlier there be no surprise if trade is operating over 400 odd miles that uh, uh, rajmahal hills are located so this is just to make the suggestion and after all um, uh, no this we have covered dr rakar we can you know sort of continue with this so then we come straight to uh, to today's issue which is uh, how are rock art and inscription uh, to be possibly uh, related or shown to be related now rock art is a symbolic special uh, verbal narrative uh, that is the oldest form of expression although intentional cupules lines and figures carved on stone bone ivory and so on excels precede in india the hypothesis linking such expression with the origin of language is nothing new the idea being that marks and figures occupy some important place in the cognitive linguistic life of prehistoric people and could have phonetic auditory value uh, for creating cooperative behavior now just this morning i was uh, i mean i have had, had that article for a while Uh, it's uh, published in nature communications by morgan et al uh, 250, 2015 and they uh, they suggest that uh, language was an, a very important part of learning and teaching so far as manufacture of oldowan stone stone tools uh, which is significantly older than uh, the lower paleolithic acheulean uh, tradition so language has been Uh, employed for learning and teaching the making of stone tools since the time even old old oldowan tools uh, were being made uh, much the same suggestion has been made in an excellent study uh, of the isampur quarries uh, found by professor padaya by um, cbk shipton uh, in his book on a million years of hominin sociality and it is an excellent study i found where he suggests why some amount of uh, symbolism uh, and development of language is necessary to assume for the lower paleolithic as well without which there would be no cooperative with sustained cooperative behavior and therefore no tool making would be possible so possibly the role of art rock art whether it uh, begins uh, after the coming of modern humans it, it is possibly to evoke the same sense of cooperation and uh, so on uh, that symbolic behavior that's the main driving force behind symbolic behavior and the evolution of language so such externalized expressions serve as symbolic storage uh, of memory so this is the session uh, the uh, origin of the modern mind by a cognitive psychologist called uh, uh, donald uh, the book was published 91 in which he suggests that uh symbolism and its deployment uh, externally on external media such as rock art and so on but also in a type of uh, linguistic manifestation uh, is particularly a hallmark of homo sapiens sapien but of course language ability and symbolic ability was present during uh, the homo erectus stage as well and not simply in india but also in africa and dozens of other southeast asian and australian sites uh donald's contribution is that symbolism also lies in the fact that he suggests that uh modern humans uh, use uh, rock art type of symbolism uh, for their mythic imagination but but that does not here um, have any uh, literal sort of translation that myths were being manufactured in this, in this particular area but mythic imagination means to create ideologies to martial labors and to sort of to some extent i suppose exploit as well and particularly uh, across the gender axis uh, that certain types of labors are more privileged uh, for instance hunting than say gathering so these are all products of mythic imagination so uh, that's a very charming idea uh, emerging from this discussion so in india it has a very early start too during the lower paleolithic which is the age of cupules uh, at uh, i suppose bimbetta and uh, dr giriraj kumar's work over there is absolutely uh, 
uh, stunning and carved lines appear on ostrich eggshells uh, as discussed and found by professor sonavne so this is another and chandravati chandravati pur so these are examples of early uh, art uh, in which a certain amount of gouging and so on is also involved on external media and uh, can we go to the next one please next slide please so uh, in the vindhyan region if we look at the sort of density of population in a particular area then uh, that is fairly well reflected in the density of paintings because as i just sort of mentioned in the introduction painting activity is a very social activity and uh, if 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 it has an important place both in the mythic imagination in the mythic scheme of things as uh, defined by donald and in the everyday social as defined by guru and sarukai then the whole, the fact that there is a lot of it over there stands explained that it it is not as privileged an activity as we seem to make it today it is very much part of uh, daily life as uh, it obtains in villages even now so uh, there is that and uh, uh, most of these sites also have ring burials particularly on the escarpment but not so in the valley areas uh, next next one please uh the excavations uh, in the vindhyan area mostly by uh, the two universities of the area which are uh, of the region which also called the oxford and cambridge of india you see so i believe uh, allahabad is the oxford of india and banaras is the cambridge of india never mind so uh, a lot of uh, uh, faunal types obtain and these are the domesticates and if i may uh point out the names of sites tokwa which is on uh, the confluence of adwa and belan near mirzapur and it is a neolithic pre nbp uh without and with iron and you get cattle buffalo sheep goat and hemionus khar at jhusi alahabad which is also neolithic nbp historic you get cattle buffalo sheep goat and pig and dog and hitapatti you get cattle senuwar uh, this is uh, professor bp singh site which is very famous uh, for, for a very long time uh, and it has cattle buffalo sheep goat pig i would say raja nal katila raja pura agya bir malar i would think that the source for the, the the wild stock is also local and it is vindhyas itself so the depiction of a number of these species uh, in the, in vindhyan dog art is not a surprise may we go to the next one please so this is the panel uh, dr prabhakar was uh, the chairperson uh, was just telling us that uh, he has visited this particular site called mukhadari and uh, you can see a school of fish has been depicted over here so there is aquatic fauna and we know from the excavation report of tokwa that uh, catfish as well as rehu you know obtain in this particular region because belan is a tributary of uh, the ganges uh, and since these two species of pen in ganges along with several others my own uh, hypothesis is that this beak specimen over here uh, i don't know uh, you know uh, noimar feels that it is a sort of catfish anyway so let's, let's uh, re remain with that so uh, all species that are found in ganges uh, i i wanted just to add uh, that the freshwater dolphins are have been hunted for a very long time and so have the crocodile and they are not depicted over here at mukhadari but uh, so the species that are not actually uh, painted on in the rock art on samples of fauna could well have been used earlier on so let's keep a sort of uh, sort of hypo uh, hypothetical realm a bit broad and on the right hand side of the panel you find Uh, humans these are actually uh, female figures over here and male figures sort of walking away on top and female figures uh, in association with uh, this is the zebu uh, which is the uh, local cattle species most uh, most prominent and there is elephants and so on and so forth may i just mention over here very quickly although i had left this for later that 
there's been some amount of what we think misinterpretation of these smaller symbols at the very bottom of the panel over here now a number of workers uh, have suggested that this is some sort of uh, chronological uh, stratigraphy over here where these uh, these have been called abstract designs our own uh, take on this is that these are actually the building blocks for paintings over here now if you see the square image over here you can just see how the idea of this square has been uh, used in the drawing of this bull figure over here over here as well inside the elephant over here in this antelope over here and so on and so forth and these are the design elements over here which have been used on human figures so for teaching and learning purposes these form the uh, lexicon of shapes that may be much as your computer screen which has a certain number of shapes given so perhaps these shapes shapes uh, negotiate the, uh, the 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 surfaces that obtain on rocks best and therefore they are the stable shapes recommended at most sites now this is from morana pahar and this is an unusual absolutely painting i think this may even be paleolithic if we can date it in the next phase of the project for which all help is requested that this is probably uh, no can we just go back this is the only yellow painting that we have found over the entire area and this is probably got some fat animal fat mixed in it with i don't know crushed quartz or something like that and there's a whole row of human figures over here you know i've seen discovery channel films in which people in congo are thrusting spears up uh, elephants uh, chest and so on and lungs and heart so human figures are arranged at the bottom there is un underneath the superimposition there is a cattle image uh, given and uh, so this is a very rare painting uh, there isn't a second one like this at all and needs to be dated for us to absolutely confirm that paleolithic populations were possibly if not just upper paleolithic present in the uh, mendian uplands next please and uh, this is a typical mendian agro pastoral cattle station so so we can go to the next slide please i mean yeah so uh, in excavations like poldiva and chopni mando uh, it it was discovered by alabad university archaeologists like mr jain pal uh, that uh, a lot of cattle hoof marks are coming out and uh, the outlines of a coral and as well as the floor obtains so we were looking for you no know, graphic examples of how contemporary uh, pastoral uh, cattle stations obtained and uh, they form uh, they have a very good analogy to what is being found again and again in the area in neolithic excavations so the over overview of paintings uh, i've already given verbally and in, in the interest of time we can possibly just skip this uh slide may we go to the next slide uh, professor prabhakar okay features of the rock surfaces are used to simulate real landscapes now i told you that movement is a, a very important um element in the rock paintings uh, in vindhyas and the other thing is that the real landscape over there has been reflected in 
the geography of the painting. And there are two panels uh, at Likhani Adari, which I shall have occasion to discuss in this, uh, in this slide, where the directionality absolutely follows the original di uh, di directionality of the valley and the landscape uh, features have also been uh, reflected uh, through existing rock features. So can we go to the next one, please? Right. And the next one. We'll just come to the paintings themselves because I think the audience has taken insufficient uh, sort of uh, background on this. So this is the Windham site and uh, a couple of um, uh, funnel drawings over here. Uh, the one on the extreme left has, uh, has been sampled and I think it's dated to around 13,000 uh, KABP. And uh, that is the calcite layers on the top part of the shelter. This is a view of the Khajuri River uh, along which uh, four shelters are located on Windham uh, River. And these are some paintings. So paintings are below the calcite as well as above the calcite. And it is quite likely this sediment is actually Upper Paleolithic. And the human figures obtained over here in a variety of forms, but these are amongst the earliest. And uh, some design designs and figure of eights. The figure of eight over here actually evolves into the most stable part of the style of the Vindhyan region uh, of, the, uh, of the part away from Son River. Now, Mukhadari is on nearer to the Son River. And the way human shapes are drawn over there uh, are much closer to the Central Indian style, and many uh, Bhimbetka figures are in the, in, drawn in that fashion. But in this particular region, we get double tri triangle in one inverted upon the other as the stable form for drawing of human figures. But then again, in the, some of these are found in Bhimbetka as well. So, uh, next slide, please. And there is Dr. Roman Banerjee taking a sample way back in 2010 of uh, the calcites at Windham Falls. Next, please. And here are close up uh, and de stretched uh, sort of. Uh, if I can quickly show you, uh, or if you can see, I think uh, each, each of these paintings has got uh, some movement images as well. Like the cluster over here has, has got. Uh, uh, two dogs cornering a deer, and there will be some more images of that later. These are actually human forms over here underlying the calcites. And uh, there are a couple of deer images with more faunal paintings over here, which we couldn't see at all through the uh, naked eye. And uh, again, many, many more paintings. And the dates, of course, are very, very interesting. It was very heartening and very nice of Roman to have found the time and come and joined us as of his supervisor, Alistair Pike, who have done all this dating at his own cost under permission from the Archaeological Survey of India. So the narrative themes that we found outstanding are ones in which uh, dogs and deer and dancers and arrow crossfire, which is animation, elephant hunts, royal soldiers hunt, and so on and so forth. Next, please. Uh, so this is the Absolutely minuscule. Uh, actually, this is also a dog. So there are a couple of dogs that have cornered this deer near a part of the calcite dated by uranium thorium method to around 13,000 KABP. So I was very thrilled because we have been told that there has been no figurative art from the Pleistocene in India. Never mind how uh, how much older the cupules when they are found will make Vindhyas. But finding a figurative art from the Pleistocene over here was very, very exciting and well worth uh, uh, as good a reward as one could expect. So uh, you can see a, some brush has been used uh, and the use of stylus is also very, very clear um, along with finger flutings and so on, which calls for uh, a discussion of Liliana Janik's work in, in, in the French context and another paper of hers, which I read on, on Scandinavia, how finger marks and flutings in the Lasco and the Neo, I think, if I'm not mistaken, caves as well, show that elders and youngsters, both male and female, uh, of both age sets, were working together in some of what has been uh, claimed to be masterpieces. So teaching of rock art is part, a big part of the purpose of rock art. And this is something 
that uh, was very pleasantly surprising for us. So we have said about, now you can see finger flutings in human images. Uh, these are actually stick figures, so-called, and the other types of stick figures also obtain Bimbetka type of st stick figures. A short distance from this, there is an active wolf layer, and there are some stick figures on that. So we'll just leave that for the while. Now this is Lekhaniya Dhari, and this is where we can get to see some uh, of the uh, visual spatial arrangement of paintings. Now this is in two directions. This painting takes you outside the valley, and this painting brings you inside the valley. So this, uh, this is the elephant capture expedition, which is a medieval, absolutely medieval painting over here. And the early historic part, uh, which is the lighter ochre uh, figure over here, uh, which uh, Manoranjan goes uh, wrongly calls a sort of gateway into the, in which captured elephant is being led. This is actually a stupa figure. I mean, anybody could say. So uh, there's that. So there are several periods of when this is de-stretched, several periods of painting uh, activity uh, in different hues of uh, ochres are, uh, are visible over here. And this is probably the earliest and this is got to be Paleolithic, again, late Paleolithic, but it is juxtaposed with uh, uh, an Iron Age engraving probably of a human figure. The only one that we have found, it is actually been gouged out. My own student, Mr. Rishabh Kumar, got up on the ledge and sort of rang his ran his fingers along the flutings over here. And there's actually a channel-like thing over there, uh, whether done by rock or whether done by uh, iron edge. Uh, so uh, iron tools, so there's that. And I have some de-stretch images of this one later. But here, the, uh, Manoranjan Ghosh, again, in his book of 1932, says this is actually a bird trap. This is a net in which large birds have been trapped at Likhaniyadari. And uh, there are some soldiers again over here, Royal Sepoys, uh, Zamindar soldiers or whatever. So they've got swords and all, and they're sort of hunting birds uh, in what is clearly uh, indigenous area. So interaction between the two, whether the spin-off was trade uh, and uh, for the, uh, the trade with the outside community from which some amount of uh, remuneration or revenues would have accrued uh, to indigenous communities in exchange for their forest products like uh, khair and uh, all kinds of forest uh, woods and uh, silkworms and uh, you know cocoons and so on and so forth. So uh, there are two caves in this particular valley. This is the valley of the river Garai. And uh, the upstream cave Chunadari shows the same procession coming back. Now, that is really mind-blowing and it has taken all of 10 years for us to understand that this is what's on. The procession is shown going in at Lekhaniyadari and it is a public painting and that's a, saying a lot because there is a distinction between private and public uh, spaces even in prehistory. And the one over there is not a long-term, it, it is a sort of camp. Uh, this one is a huge cave shelter, which Roman also has visited, and you can see his video there later. But and this painting style also speaks of, you know, this is done for family entertainment. This is not on public display. Now, could we have the next next uh, slide, please? This is the de-stretch image, and you can see clearly that this is for home consumption, and the subaltern characters, all the characters have been converted to subaltern characters. And this is for home consumption, probably drawn by women. Uh, this is my feeling about it. And we will discuss that slightly later as well. Uh, you can see that the hairstyles over here, this T-shaped extension of hair at the back, uh, also obtains at uh, Windham Falls and nowhere else except here as well as uh, uh, Likhaniyadari and Chunadari. And the water carrier over here, you know, Bengi Pe, Pani Ka, 
vehla leke as we say gana leke ja raha hai and this gentleman is also carrying some stuff uh, on his shoulders and uh, these are soldiers there's somebody carrying food over here and uh, they are food soldiers there are a couple of monitor lizards that they have also captured in the expedition and where whereas the entourage entered only with one elephant in the other painting pursuing another in this they have got one two three four elephants over here and every other character over here has been given this t shape now what how is this significant well to my mind uh, or to the historian's mind this would mean that um, even in these early uh, late historical to early medieval times people were aware of the ethnic difference were aware of their lesser privileged status vis-a-vis soldiers and other representatives of the uh, um, of the larger tradition outside so that if they considered their uh, iconic space to soldiers at the beginning of the valley they jolly well took it back uh, you know several times over in this sort of painting so rock paintings are not simply innocent material done for decoration of the houses there's some of that as well it is also negotiating one's place in the world it is making sense of the world it is historical it is historical source material next please oh sorry so no, this is one uh, shelter on morana pahar i just thought you'd see the landscape next please i think we can skip it in the interest of time if you are in a hurry because we have been through this ah huh. this is panchmukhi maybe we could take this yeah so this shelter was called by uh, mr pokman who wrote most of the papers uh, some 6 or 7 in mid 19th century describing the rock art in the area and he called this the symbol cave so impl- implying thereby that the images here are very basic and you know uh, po- possibly this was at the source of radiation of these symbols which are also found at uh, other rock painting sites but having gone through thousands of images from this particular area and some of them and recently these stretched ones we found more complex compositions underlying these symbols and some with great flourish uh, the only set of uh, sort of emphatic images of women come from this particular site and are possibly earlier to these images but that's neither near nor there because they are not accurately dated but this is most likely a pastoral shelter from the presence of goat droppings even contemporarily uh, as at morana pahar and at windham falls and you know stuff and wild uh, animal spore is also found at some of these so uh, heading towards the conclusion of this talk uh, the idea of everyday social uh, which is the subject of a recent book by uh, the famous uh, political scientist i think professor gopal guru and philosopher sundar sarukai uh, this is something i would recommend to my students and to students generally who of tribal history who are trying to understand the spaces the ambiance the broadly wavelength at which these deep uh, inner communities of india have lived for millennia and never mind that before the 18th century or you know slightly earlier the uh, the uh, the appellations like caste and tribe uh, were not that well formed when there was even when there was greater truck between uh, peoples who are removed uh, from each other that there is a certain style to living in the hills and the valleys there is a certain network that operates across plains and into another set of hills by which technologies and ideas and social systems and marriages and what have you has always flowed in uh, in india broadly speaking so the uh, the the sense that guru and sarukai 
draw of the dynamics of lifestyles in those areas has been captured very wonderfully in, in, in these two terms, everyday social and in this book. So it's gladly recommended to everybody. And uh, so direct representations at the uh, Panchmukhi Hill, which Cockburn called uh, the symbol cave. Uh, this is at Morana, sorry. This is this this one is from uh, Panchmukhi Hill, and you can see three sort of uh, images of women with hair bun and clothing around the neck and around the waist, which helps identify that they are actually uh, women. And there's a horse at the top, a design horse. There is a flower over there, and a couple of others. Generally speaking, the shelters where quote unquote designs obtain or symbol symbols obtain. They are merely prompts for future painters that these are the basic shapes they may deploy in making newer images, point one. And where there is a great density of patterns like these kinds, which are drawn laboriously. I mean, it takes an enormous amount of labor to actually sort of get any of these up. So the presence of women is attested. Now, why designs is uh, something that, that I would come to after this uh, business of directionality, but I'll just quickly mention it while I'm on the subject that movement paintings are very gregarious. A big hunt has been made and how male uh, that that is that at one point of time, a huge amount of meat has been brought into the society, but that uh, uh, gathering uh, forest products and so on, which also takes an equal amount of time, if not more, is in some ways lesser pro productive. So verticality uh, builds up in society with male labor finding more representation on rock surfaces and just a handful of representation, direct representations of women compared to male figures of pains in the Indian area as in most rock art areas of India. So while these sites also report a multiplicity of what have been called decorative designs, design symbols, and so on. So my uh, take on this broadly would be, and those of uh, in our project, I suppose, working together since the last 10 years, it's wrong to share or take it uh, individually, that so-called design elements, while it yields a certain amount of the finite painting surfaces to women for their purposes. Now, what are these purposes? These are asserting their own presence, their own identity, to uh, sort of you know um, uh, spend time doing something to look after children and to make children smarter and improve their cognitive skills uh, although that is not their only pastime of course this so called designs make for a neutral set of expressions in which no conflict is created by the more more gregarious sort of rock painters of the area one is holding a sword and is sitting on a horse and he has imposed his image on top of a old elephant hunt. He does not respect history. He's there in another cave too, where he's got a couple of you know predators on either side. And again, he's holding a shield and a sword. Incidentally, in the same cave where the, uh, these these images occur, excavations reveal female skeletons with peri fractures and osteoporosis and so on and so forth. So, so to look access ob observation in his analysis of bones from Lekhaya Pahar excavation reported in 2002 book edited by V.D. Mishra and Jain Pal, uh, Mesolithic Uttar Pradesh, that uh, a certain amount of domestic violence could be the likely cause for these peri fractures and so on and so forth found from Lekhaya Pahar. Now, to protect themselves from such contingencies, it would seem that design makes for a more a neutral sort of pastime as, a, as a, opposed to other types of paintings. So uh, that uh, designs are associated therefore with the presence of uh, uh, women is the hypothesis. And um, this is directionality, as I said, uh, the, the direction from which, uh, again, part of the cognitive development process, but also reflecting uh, patterning in the sort of uh, co cognitive sort of uh, uh, wiring of the population over here, that uh, the actual entry to the valley is the direction from which the elephants are shown coming. 
and in the chuna dari cave as i mentioned and also orientation uh, sort of exercises in which uh, the younger part of the crowd who possibly made a ramp over here to make these paintings they are situated quite a bit uh, above ground level they have made these absolutely uh, wonderful uh, obliquely oriented paintings on the ceiling so it's not randomness it is actually a necessary cognitive skill and this again the uh, noted by uh, rk varma and uh, before that uh, manoranjan ghosh that this is a deer hunt scene the entire escarpment area is full of scrub forest and scrub forest has got acacia and all about 20 other i would think types of nettles and thorns they are the same thorns that i use even now in the pastoral cattle stations to keep the leopards away from the cattle so what surprise that that tradition would have already started during the neolithic or even earlier we get uh, i've read articles on uh, central and west asia when uh, kites are being constructed uh, uh, in, in the then greener uh, 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 desert areas in which masses of deer are herded in mostly gazelle deer which are also present over here they are small deer like the black buck and they are stampeded and into it but uh, archaeologists are puzzled that there are no bones found and uh, that could be explained by the fact that the whole business of trapping deer in huge quantities was not meant to uh, meant for consumption of the local population alone it was actually meant for trade possibly so that uh, could explain why there are no sort of post depositional or depositional evidence connected with such hunts and this is the direction in which the uh, deer uh, uh, stampede panel uh, is is positioned and this is the actual uh, before the time this bridge was built this very recent this is the only entry to this valley over here even manoranjan ghosh's elephant on which he came from patna uh, to record this rock art here entered from this side uh, there is no road that crosses this uh, valley over here so the deer had to be stampeded out uh, from this now uh, on to the concluding part of the lecture and comparing the uh, common ground between inscriptions of uh, uh, well inscriptions and rock paintings this is ashoka's brahmi inscription the minor rock edict of arora and the alarming uh, the, the, the distance that separates it from the likhaniya dari is alarmingly short almost as if the king himself was aware of populations living in this or population living in this area and uh, he he speaks about the sort of um, uh, you know his his extensive tour on the sada and how uh, dhamma is 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 something desirable for pe people living living on the borders also so although a student of history myself at the ba level uh, these things did not carry with them any significant imagery in the mind who are these people living at the borders and then uh, you know in the light of this inscription suddenly it begins to make sense that the people that who are being told to follow the dhamma are actually people who hold access to all the resources any empire uh, uh, like modern empire would need and therefore it is important to tell them to behave once once in a while and to cooperate i suppose that is the spirit uh, so uh, the other set of inscriptions i would like to go through here is my student uh, mr naval kumar and this is mr rajiv uh, both happily phd's now so we went looking for rock art and found these set of inscriptions over here which have been uh, which are in brahmi 7th century or so and uh, in siddha matrika uh, script uh, variant of the brahmi and they have been translated by uh, professor ak singh head of department uh, of uh, jivaji university's archaeology department who can actually read these scripts so this is actually um, a grant over here uh, of uh, to bhattara kila swami adhikrita and that this quarry this is actually a sandstone quarry i think uh, for for pillar uh, for inscriptions so couple of inscriptions uh, have remained over there to indicate the grant of this particular area and this is again another donation to the temple on vijayagarh fort also in brahmi and this is a hero stone also partly a sati stone 
which was found uh, by us uh, inside uh, the usko kile ki diwar banane mein usko chun ke yun apni usko vertically horizontally is tarike se chuna hua hai to inscription handling mein zara sa mit gaya hai so this is actually a sati stone uh, and uh, professor singh translates that uh, uh, you know son of sevada who is the local chief i suppose he was killed in action and therefore his wife sort of committed uh, suicide uh, rather burnt herself at this fire so that's a dreadful sort of thing and although i had read uh, about in anila varghese's book of much such uh, evidence coming from vijayanagar so this is the first time i have seen something from this side but dreadful nevertheless so uh, then this is uh, panchmukhi with some uh, sankha lipi uh, i remember our honorable dean professor manjit chaturvedi uh, accompanying us on this trip and we were all uh, very happy taking these pictures because it actually proves that there was a temple over there from 10th 11th century which is just sort of i mean carted off somewhere and uh, so these inscriptions occur in the same area where of paintings uh, occur so they are both representations of thoughts in graphic form on external media and uh, while rock art um, shows the development that is transitional between gestural and mimetic um, uh, this has been explained in the context of stone tool manufacture uh, by shipton that is ex- extremely well done and fully verbal communication employing material symbols in rock art and inscriptions encode actually language and not so much uh, you know vaguely defined thoughts the inscriptions are different in the sense uh, while they are similar that they use uh, iconic forms uh, that they are meant to encode languages uh, only most of the time so they are both artifices to remember things objects events over a longer time period than otherwise possible and and so on so forth next please right just go okay so they both use symbols of one kind or, or another uh, and while uh, uh, inscriptions are distinct in the sense that they they use alphabets to represents language in rock art we uh, the use of symbols uh, uh, in terms of uh, actual uh, human figures and animal figures are used to represent thoughts but possibly in the aid of orality and therefore very likely uh, they serve both to enlarge uh, the memory areas of the brain as well as the speech areas because uh, what is memory if it is not uh, discussed and from which uh, some experience can't be gained so uh, i find that there is a significant amount of uh, difference in the I- iconic worlds within rock art and within inscriptions inscriptions are less graphic less evocative but the roots have to be the same uh, materially broadly speaking so thank you that's what all i have to say Ravagas, are you muted? Thank you, Professor Ajit Patap, uh, for uh, kind of Thank you, Thank you. taking us to a wonderful journey of uh, several phases of prehistoric past and also several traditions, particularly of the Indian region. And it was uh, a really a wonderful journey, I would say. Uh, I would request uh, Sharada to uh, take over and. Uh, moderate the question and session and we can have a limited number of questions due to advantage of time so that you can be selected thank you okay. um, professor um, i will read out the questions and then you can answer them thank you professor darino and thank you sharda for your patience yes yes so i i request all the 
participants to please type their questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. Um, okay, so um, the first question is by Siddharth Chandera, who asks, what techniques were used in identifying the pigments and the medium in wall paintings? Oh, nothing very precise. Some of this uh, work has been, that's a very good question. But that is not to say that we cannot distinguish the different uh, difference in pigments, right? Uh, so there are five types of ochres. Now, that's a good question. And here's your answer that the source of most of the ochre pigments are the mudstones in the area. You can note that down. And that's a particularly geomorphic uh, sort of uh, or geomorphological term. Uh, mudstones are actually compacted sediments in uh, river valleys. Uh, so most of the deeper channels uh, carved by say Khajuri and Garai and these high uh, altitude rivers in the Vindhyan system, the valleys have got mudstones ubiquitously all over the place. So once it has been deposited by the fluvial process, then the atmosphere gets to work on that and it solidifies. Now, there, there are small pellet size, you know, uh, ferric nodules. And if you rub them uh, in some water, then it, it yields a red sort of pigment. And if you just mark rocks with that, that becomes permanent. You can make it, uh, you can alter the color depending upon the base color of the mudstone. At the There's purple mudstones as well. And uh, if you mix organic material like fats and resins into it, then and probably other things as well, uh, then it can be uh, altered slightly. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Rakesh Tiwari in his 1990 book, uh, Rock Art of Mirzapur, has done an analysis of the pigment. So if you go to that, you will be able to see that. Okay. And uh, the second question is by Shikha Rai. Uh, she asks, the region of Vindhya or the Vindhyan region was used as a connecting route, which was connecting the Ganga plains with central India and further. So yes. do you feel that this region was more diversely populated during the prehistoric times and do we get such patterns in rock paintings? Yes, certainly it was very diversely populated, but I think the source population for uh, for it is the same one that Chris Clarkson and before that Professor G.R. Sharma's team and probably before that Gudrun Corvinus feels is the Stone Age population that comes in for heaven's sakes from the Narada Valley and the lateral spread of that, I mean, if I uh, if I were to recommend one single uh, research problem uh, to all of you, it would be to actually not simply focus on the Southeast Asian expansion of that population, but to work more rigorously on the lateral expansion in all directions from there. So the diverse populations that you speak of uh, tells me that uh, the same population that is there in Son Valley actually, uh, as from Narvada Valley, it spreads north, south, east, and west and helps to populate Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand and Southern Bihar and ultimately Odisha and Bengal as well. So yes, there is diversity. Now, diversity is uh, may also be interpreted in, ter in terms of phenotypes obtaining, say, um, I remember this article by Lukacs in which he discusses the skeleton material from Lekhaya. And he says, while it is confirmed that the Mesolithic population on the Morana Pahar is absolutely related with the ones across the river in Sariova Par Plains like Sarai Naharai and so on, that some of there is some evidence of the gracility of the specimens on top of the uh, Vindhan escarpment as opposed to the, the lack of that or, and so on and so forth in, uh, in, in the plains. So yes, there is diversity there again. And probably with migrations further far afield, you know, local dialects and, you know, variations in rock art uh, sort of uh, um, styles also occurs. Uh, the same participant has a few more questions. So I'll take them up one by one. Uh, she also asks, do you have any observations for selecting particular spaces like ceilings of the rock shelter or... Um, so, so on, on for, for particular, particular subject, subject, or is it just a random selection for rock painting? No, it can't be random selection. I mean, the selection of the site itself is very purposive, isn't it? So how can painting over there be random? Random in a very limited sense of the term that if this child 
and there are many ch- ch- children's doodles over there but then again the pattern would be that they are all close to the residential shelter they are also lower down on the vertical walls so the reach would determine where it would be so there would always be a pattern everything archaeological has always got a pattern okay um so uh, the last one from the same participant what is your opinion on the ratanpura inscription of ashok which is found from chandoli region the inscription well, is written as, as with a bihari, i would be happy if it is absolutely genuine i am sure it is okay um so the next question is by ramis raz raza who asks is there any evidence of blue pigment in rock art uh not in the vindhyas i haven't seen no i haven't okay um dr s venkat raman asks what type of material may be used for water carrying and what is the period and which place what kind of material oh just the uh, earthen ware pitchers you know i mean ye bhangi you know classic shravan kumar ka bhangi you know in which shravan kumar carried his blind parents for tirtha so that is what was actually shown i mean a bhangi like that was native water carriers even during colonial times recently as colonial times you know is when it was accepted people would do the, these uh, bits of labor i mean uh, or even now in savan ka you know all those people going to devgarh from delhi they all carrying those bangies you know and carrying the water so that is there not to mention um i don't know who the participant is i i can't um, this this name doesn't makes sense anyway so he or she is asking who were the actual creators or artists were they men or women they were both and uh, binu thakur asks how can we preserve rock paintings how can we preserve the rock paintings oh ask archaeological survey of india yeah. um subodha mandali asks um are there any tribal groups who, those who are still practicing any art work i guess rock art or rock painting over their mud houses um which yes. is similar to the rock yes. art yes the coal i had a student sudha dr sudha now she has written a full thesis which has been passed this year earlier on uh, on the history of the coals from 18th century up to the 20th century so she i, I saw a number of pictures taken by her of hut paintings but it's a smaller surface you know yeah, when you are in living in the hills you know you have much more space uh, that you can command so naturally that affects the representations in villages uh okay um so can you very briefly um answer this question of satyam dubey who asks how how do you convert these blur paintings to a more clear ones oh you have to spend to highlight certain feet 120 rupees will buy you the distress software on your mobile phone so you put your digital image and process it there are eight or nine types of processes for highlighting you know uh, different types of uh, so it can be downloaded on the mobile phone as well yes uh, Okay. rock art and hanser that's the one i have so you can mm-hmm. use that uh rami saza has another question how cup marks are important in rock art studies oh read lots of uh, robert bednarik and giriraj kumar in the indian context and uh, well they, they are supposed to be products of uh, the labors of our earliest ancestors and while their function is not very clear i read in uh, dr giriraj kumar's paper Uh, that it takes uh, nearly 6000 blows to create one single cup mark but then you know uh, shipton's uh, idea of uh, co- creating cooperative you know sort of sensibilities uh, probably is probably the answer behind why cup marks were created um anita singh asks uh, uh, please explain how rock art is related with inscriptions and what is the relationship between the two uh, you just gave the whole lecture on that <laughs> they are part of the same tradition but one represents undefined thought the other represents a language can you get that inscriptions have always got a language behind them not necessarily rock art in rock art the representation in rock art is a representation of the memory and not particularly language in which those thoughts were thought 
have you got it uh so the last question again i don't know who the participant is um so he or she asks um which is a good dating method which is most or more reliable for dating rock art well i can just parrot that accelerator mass spectr spectrometry because the problem with roman's method which is uranium thorium is it gives you the date the earliest date for the calcite and not the date for the painting and while Uh, guys in indonesia are partying saying their uh, their art is 44000 years old what is there to say that the paintings at windham uh, i mean how old they are you know unless we have a direct method so uranium thorium is not a direct dating method but accelerator mass spectrometry under permission or with the permission of archaeological survey of india is highly recommended okay if so i think samples um, obtained in the paint samples uh so i guess this is the last question in the q and a box again an anonymous attendee is asking what are the raw materials for white color paintings mainly found in south india well quartz i believe i i hear quartz quartz crushed quartz uh, sort of leads to that sort of thing but very often uh, the, the the calcite surface itself provides the white background on which to uh, paint but yes small amount of white paintings exists in morana pahad as well and that is crushed quartz i think used with some binder like resin so i think we have taken most of the questions sharada so if i, I may ask a quick question yeah, yeah sure, sure. Can. Can. we are yeah yours will be we cannot the panelists cannot type strangely questions Uh, thank you for a fascinating lecture professor ajay pratap my question is very brief and simple you said that the elephant hunting not hunting but capturing scenes are medieval why could they not be early historical because arthashastra uh, depicts very very precisely you know the, uh, the the process of capturing an elephant and then taming it and so on my friend it both are technically speculations you see because the only uh, arbitration can be provided by direct dating isn't it but True. you may well be right i would welcome it i mean it's really historical but my own uh, take on it was uh, configured in terms of the local trade network that the chowkis over there were built by the medieval sort of uh, zamindars of the area who were extracting forest produce and were sh shipping it off using uh, the uh, garai uh, river route from uh, lower vindhyas so their sepoys would need to come there in the medieval period this is point 1 secondly sepoy paintings coat and coat also exist on the morana escarpment i unfortunately couldn't include and much the same things there are soldiers marching there were bows and arrows it's almost as if, as if flag marches were taking place all over the indigenous territories to remind them that the state needed their Uh, raw material securely over there, and the, the threat with violence, uh, as my friend Upinder Singh would say, that ancient state was also very coercive. So uh, you know, it could be ancient for all you know. Yes, quite right. Thank you. Thank you uh, once again, uh, Professor Rajiv Patel, for this wonderful uh, talk and. Uh, Thank you, Sharda, for moderating the session. And uh, now I would request Professor Michel Danino to uh, conclude the session with his uh, remarks. Well, I I will simply say that um, uh, you you have given a, a very fine context of rock art in the Vindhyas, and um, you have cleared a lot of misconceptions, you know, uh, in the popular mind, in particular in the process, and uh, given us a good cultural background. in particular as much as can be speculated upon or figured out uh, socio cultural context and that was very important so we are very thankful for your presentation we understand it could go on for a much much longer time with the hundreds if not thousands of images uh, but within the limited time you you gave us a lot of information thank you so much and finally i yeah thank Finally, I thank all the participants uh, at, you know, who registered and participated in this uh, seminar, and I am looking forward to meet them again uh, in the next month. Thank, thank you, thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you.